up the oxygen here. And you, this, your heart then pumps the blood through this device. It gets oxygenated and it returns to your vein. So it's a pumpless artificial lung, which is a, a unique device that allows you to oxygenate and remove carbon dioxide, perform the function of a lung in a much more simplified and less expensive way, really, than, than the pump system. If you need extra flow, you can actually now put a pump in the system and drive even more flow than your heart can do through the nasal lung. And just some of the characteristics of it, the key ones are that the, the surface of that membrane uh, are, have been uh, modified so that the, the biggest problem with, the, with an artificial lung is you have to have air on one side and blood on the other side. And the function of the lung is to get oxygen from the air into the blood and get carbon dioxide from the blood into the air. And that air-blood interface is the thing that nobody has been able to achieve as well as it's done in nature. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And they came closer with that by having a well-designed and engineered surface. And it allows us to not have to thin the blood as much so you don't have as many bleeding complications. And also the low resistance meant you didn't really need a pump because your own heart could pump through it. So that was the technical advance that made this. And here it is in place in somebody's leg. And you can see it's a very simple device that now our bedside ICU nurses look after a patient who's on an artificial lung just like they look after someone on a ventilator. And we made the move when we had this young girl who was dying of uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. We were doing CPR on her when we actually put the device in. And there she was after her transplant. She actually ended up having a heart-lung transplant for her condition. But nevertheless, it was our first attempt to bridge a patient uh, to transplantation using the device. We also had an idea of how to use this device in a unique condition of primary pulmonary hypertension where patients, and they're usually young female, develop a condition where the blood vessels in your lung just start to contract down and you can't, your heart can't pump across those vessels in your lung. And so what we decided to do was put the nova lung from the pulmonary artery over to the other side of the heart and bypass the lung and provide this low resistance surface to offload that heart to keep the patient alive until you can do a transplant. And that's been another uh, indication. And uh, as you can see over the years, the number of patients that we're doing, uh, our administrators are watching closely, uh, continues to increase. Bridge the transplant, bridge to recovery are the ones that when we transplant the lung, if it doesn't work right away, and then the red ones are patients with other conditions that may need lung support urgently uh, that are in our hospital. And so with the bridge to transplant, which is a novel activity, we've done 10, we've actually done 14 cases now and bridged all of them successfully to a, a lung transplant and eight out of 10 of those are long-term survivors. So we really have made a major stride in those uh, patients. This is a patient on the Nova Lung, this young girl, we did at Fitzer Jet for with her dad and again, we were doing CPR on her as the team, Mike Shapiro and myself, in the middle of the night. We're installing the Nova Lung, and two days later, she's off the ventilator, eating, talking, and sitting in the, in the intensive care unit. And she stayed there for uh, 31 days. And she would have been dead that night for 31 days. Uh, she stayed there on the Nova Lung until we got lungs for her. It started to get small lungs for children, so they tend to wait a little longer. And there she is six months after her transplant. So that is uh, another unique uh, achievement. So we can make a few inroads with some of the unique technologies that we have in keeping patients alive for a little bit longer and, and getting them for that lung transplant. But really, the reality right now for end-stage lung disease is when you, your lungs fail, you need new lungs. And, and how are we going to do that? Can we safely improve the number of lungs that we transplant. So I'm going to move into the ex vivo diagnosis and repair part of this uh, talk. And what I'm going to cover is the basics of organ preservation. How do you take one organ out of a patient, transport it across the country, and put it into somebody uh, else on the other end of the country? Secondly, talk about the concept of what is our philosophy of what we're doing in transplants, looking at dying organ versus recovering organ. 
and then introduced the concept of personalized medicine for the organ. You may have heard of personalized medicine for patients, targeted therapies, trying to say what is a specific therapy for, for a specific patient in a specific condition. One size doesn't fit all. We need to start treating the organs the same way, looking at the diagnostics, diagnose what's wrong with the organ, treat it and make it better, pre-prepare it for transplant, and then look at repairing and regenerating the organs as well. So the, the, in the transplant adventure, there are a lot of injuries that are inflicted on the lung. When someone is brain dead and in an intensive care unit, they're on a mechanical ventilator, they have a risk of pneumonia, they could have aspiration of stuff from their stomach, they could be traumatized, they could have low blood pressure. All of that causes injury to the lungs. Then you take the lungs out and you store them, in, and what we normally do is cool them, and I'll, I'll expand on that, and then transport them, and then you transplant them into the recipient. And when you reintroduce the blood flow to the new organ, you get an inflammatory response, you get injury related to the new oxygen present presentation, and you get what we call ischemia reperfusion injury. And that's the thing that gets our patients into trouble in the very early time after uh, lung transplantation. Now, our current strategy for organ preservation is a cold flush solution or static preservation. And that solution LPD that we developed became uh, commercialized as Perfidex and is now the world standard for lung preservation. And it does provide reliable preservation of the organ for up to 12 hours. The, 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 the theory behind that is when you cool an organ down to 4 degrees, you cool down all of the metabolic processes down to about 5% of normal. So basically what you, this protects the organ because the dying processes slow down. The metabolic processes slow down so that the energy requirements are less. But the problem with that is the reparative processes also slow down. Everything is shut down. So it's sort of suspended. So while you prevent, our philosophy has been to slow down dying and rush like crazy to get the lung transplanted, we've sort of taken a different tack and saying, well, if we had a way that instead of looking at slowing down the lung, we could actually have it so that it could work and start to make it better, maybe we can achieve um, better results. So the first problem is our focus has been on slowing down the process of death rather than facilitating recovery. The second thing is that in the current practice, as I've alluded to, we really only find out how that lung is going to work after we put it in. As much as we do all of our testing, the acid testing, when you take the plants off and you see if the lung works or not, and that's really a very difficult part of the work we do. Ha the, it would be much better if we could predict how that lung is going to work before we actually put it into the patient. And we've done a significant amount of work. Uh, Hiro Kamida, a surgeon who works with us, from Japan, uh, did some very exciting work showing that if we biopsy the lung, and many of you that are lung transplant patients in the audience know that you, you consented to this study where we said we're going to take a little biopsy of the lung to find out about the injury that happened to the transplanted lung. We take a biopsy before we put it in, and we take a biopsy after we've reperfused it so that we can understand the processes in the genes that are pl at play in this, in this injury. So by taking a biopsy of the lung, Hero was able to find genes that would predict that it was a good or a low-risk group, a good lung, or, or, or a lung with some injury. So we, these were biopsies of the lung before we even put it in the patient. We can predict the outcome. Now, we don't have that as a clinical test, and we need to develop it. This slide here is, is a microarray where we use the gene chip, where you can have 30,000 genes on one chip. And each little green line or red line is, is the gene level. Gene, green, green is down-regulated genes and, uh, that are turned off. Red is genes that are turned on. And what we've done now is we found out 120 genes that give us an important message that when we looked at the lungs that we transplanted and then we analyzed them this way, this test was able to tell us that the, the lungs with this pattern had patients that would do poorly. 